In this lecture, I'm going to introduce you to some drums and drummers in the Dagbon tradition from a people known as Dagbamba, who live on the southern savanna of Ghana. The hourglass-shaped drum you see here is the lunga, and as you will soon hear, this drum is capable of astonishing flexibility in pitch and tone color. The thing that gives the drum its flexibility is those chords that run from drumhead to drumhead. When the player squeezes those chords with his forearm selectively, that will raise or lower the pitch of the drumhead and also modulate its tone color. This drum is called the gung gong, and as you can probably tell from looking at it, its sound is much deeper and more robust and not nearly as flexible. Here you see a man who makes both kinds of drums, and I resonate deeply with the companionship he obviously feels with his friend there. Those who play these two drums, Lunga and Gungong, are known as Lunsi. In addition to being expert drummers, the Lunsi fill important roles in Dagbamba society, and I'm going to focus on one of those roles in particular after we've heard and learned about some of their music. The piece we're going to hear is Nao Bao, a Salima, or praise name, dance song of Dagbon. The title, which is spelled much differently from how I understand it is to be pronounced, means Ferocious Wild Bull, and the eponymous Wild Bull was the king of Dagbon, Na Apudu, who reigned during the late 1800s. He once scoffed at a warlord who challenged him, I am a dangerous wild bull. Kill me if you can. That saying has immortalized him. People still quote him to this day and sing about him. In this performance, just an excerpt from a field recording, we will hear four lunsi, two of them playing the higher-pitched lunga and two playing the deeper voice gungong. The singer has a magnificent voice and a very intense vibrato. That long electronic fade-out means, of course, that there was more music, and it's impossible to tell by this excerpt how much more music. But we heard enough music for us to get a good sense of how the piece is laid out formally. There's a drummed introduction in three parts, actually a little more complicated than that, then a sung verse, then a drummed refrain, and that verse-refrain pairing continues until the fade-out during verse 3. Presumably that 
pattern holes indefinitely. What the singer was singing is, as you might have surmised, Na'abudu's challenge. I am a dangerous wild bull. Kill me if you can. But that's not the entire text of the song. Let's not forget about drum language. Even though the refrains are drummed, those patterns have a meaning in Dagbanli, the spoken language of the Dagbamba. The patterns those drummers are playing mean, it is now Biao, that's him. It is now Biao, kill him. Parts of those short phrases are repeated a few times. I want to take a closer look at that three-part introduction, off which, as I indicated, there's more than meets the eye, because there's some interesting stuff going on there. We hear both types of drums, starting with the solo lunga player. Could you tell that he was squeezing those chords with his forearm as he played? Did you hear the pitch gradually rise as he carefully applied that pressure? Next comes an answer from the gungong drums and the other lunga player. This is actually a little polymetric exercise, the relationship between the parts being that same three to two relationship that we heard in El Aparecido a few lectures ago. The third apparently introductory gesture is actually the drummed refrain that I talked about earlier. But here I'm considering it a part of the introduction because its meaning doesn't actually come into focus until after we've heard a sung verse. Now let's listen to the entire opening again and I'll guide you through it. Now I want to shift the focus to the obvious rhythmic complexity that we were hearing during the verses. You hear some emphatic downbeats by the gungong players, separated by an interval of time during which the two lunga players are accompanying the singer. The downbeats themselves are not all that interesting, but the drumming between them is awfully complex. Listen to a little of that to see if you can tell what I mean. I don't know quite what to say about that. It's possible that there's some freewheeling playing going on at times, but I don't actually think that's the case. I think what you're hearing is two drummers with a very clear rhythmic role to play, with their drummed patterns likely representing more short phrases in the spoken language having to do with a bull or a warlord or something like that, and those patterns would, in all likelihood, fit at least two different meters. But it's hard to get a sense of that because the music is so pointillistic. Do you remember when I used the adjective kaleidoscopic in my last lecture to describe the texture of the Agbekor Vulolo with all six of those percussionists playing a constant wash of closely interlocked drum language patterns? When you look into a kaleidoscope, there is no visual silence anywhere to be found. Every square millimeter of your field of view is occupied by a shard of colored glass, reflected times six or eight by the mirrors in the chamber that holds the glass shards. Similarly, there was no silence anywhere in that music. 
But in this music, the silences are cavernous, setting apart every stroke. That's why I described it as pointillistic, which of course is not a musical term, but a painterly one. If you will look at some of the paintings done by the pointillists who were active in France, especially during the late 19th through early 20th centuries, you'll see all the paint laid on in short bursts instead of long, fluid, lyrical brushstrokes. In really extreme examples, a close-up view will yield nothing but colored dots on a white background, and you'll have to lengthen your viewing distance to resolve it into an image. Do you see why I described this music as pointillistic? Perhaps you recall that I described Eva Ion's Azúcar de Caña the same way. Let's hear the piece once more, just for the sake of enjoying its complexity and intensity. Earlier, I made passing reference to the role that the Lunsi, the drummers, play in Dagbamba society. I want to return to this theme briefly because that role includes several vital components, one of which I want to examine closely. The Lunsi are verbal artists, counselors to royalty, cultural experts, entertainers, and genealogists. It is that last item I want to focus on. In particular, I want to entertain the question, how did the Lunsi come to be genealogists? The answer, I think, can be found in the tradition of drum language. Understand that the Dagbamba, like other equatorial African tribes, are only recently literate, and by recently I mean only for the last couple of centuries. After all, up until that time, the Dagbamba were foraging people, hunter-gatherers, and to my knowledge, no hunter-gatherer people have ever invented a written language. What need would they have for it? Written language began not as literature, but as record-keeping, and certain kinds of record-keeping become important only after there is grain to be harvested and granaries for storing it and governments who keep control of the granaries. In other words, food distribution. When there are cities and a larger population, it's important to keep track of how many bushels of grain there are in the granary, and how many we'll need to add in order to get through the next year, and how many slaves are working the fields, and so forth. Those are not the kinds of records that foraging cultures need worry about. 
Nevertheless, some records are important to a preliterate society, but they're not those kinds of records. Moreover, they are the kinds of records that can be passed on orally, provided they're rehearsed and checked constantly, and you really can't do that with bushels of grain in a granary. This is where drum language and genealogy meet. Genealogy is important to any society. When someone dies and leaves an inheritance, it's important to know how to distribute that inheritance fairly. The only way to assure that is for someone or some designated group of people to memorize those genealogies so that a record of exact degree of relatedness is available. In a culture that has no written language, those records must be stored in memory. Memory is notoriously unreliable, and many examples could be marshaled from all of our lives to demonstrate that fact. So how does one assure the accuracy of memorized genealogies? Well, here's how. Designate a particular group of people to be responsible for that information. Charge those people with the task of gathering as a group and reciting those genealogies on a regular basis, say every three days. Those are the people who will not only commit the genealogies to memory, but who will check each other's memory during the recitation. Choose the people who have the best mnemonic device ready to hand. Trust that memory work to them. What mnemonic device would serve the purpose? Well, if you live in a culture with a drum language tradition, what could possibly better serve that purpose than a drum? Imagine sitting with a group of your fellow Lunsi, all reciting the tribe's genealogy, either serially or simultaneously, while tapping out those names on a sensitive drum capable of a close approximation of the syllables that are being formed by your mouth and vocal apparatus. In a sense, you'd be getting that stored into your memory in two ways, both in your mind and in your fingertips. Can you imagine a better way of doing it? Now I want to introduce you to the Mbira, the so-called African thumb piano. This is an instrument that takes many forms and can be found across the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa. Some take the form of a lightweight resonant wooden box, which is also a serviceable description of a guitar or violin. Some are made of planks. In the case of those extremes, the sound can be quite different. The thing they all have in common is springy tines. You can call them keys, if you like, attached to a sort of axle and arranged in a chevron pattern. You see that in the examples I'm showing you here. Nowadays, those tines are made of spring steel. Traditionally, they were made of bamboo, which is also springy. The chevron arrangement places the instrument's lowest notes at the center of the instrument and also closer to the player's body, given the way the instrument is held, with the higher notes outward in both directions. The keys are depressed and released by the thumbs, hence thumb piano. Some of the instruments include additional sound sources, namely those bottle caps that are loosely attached by means of nails or screws. When the body of the instrument picks up the vibration of the keys, that vibration is, in turn, transferred to those bottle caps, which vibrate in sympathy with the primary sound and produce a sort of buzzing effect. In the recording we're about to hear, that buzzing may remind you of the sound of a jazz drummer playing a snare drum with steel brushes, not sticks. Here's Nema Musasa, played by Shona musicians from Ghana. There are two Mbira players who are later joined by a third player who is playing a pair of rattles known as Hosho.
I'm sure you were struck by how repetitious that music was. Perhaps you also noticed that it had a cumulative quality, almost like erecting a building from the ground up. The piece began with a single imbira player who was playing a two-part ostinato, whose meter is best felt as fairly broad triple time. Well, there's that word ostinato again, and for good reason. As I mentioned in my last lecture, a lot of sub-Saharan African music is dependent on it. I call this one a two-part ostinato because it's built on two regularly alternating chords, a sort of out harmony followed by an in harmony, or perhaps you perceive it as an up harmony followed by a down harmony. If I were to describe it in terms of harmonic function, I would say it was an active harmony, a harmony characterized by tension, followed by a more relaxed harmony that resolved the tension. In other words, like dominant resolving to tonic. Each of these harmonies requires two measures, so the whole pattern is four measures long, and that four measure phrase cycles constantly throughout the piece. This is the piece's foundation. After that first imbira player had played six complete cycles, a second embarrassed joined him playing a melody that included a descending scale and some accents that clearly did not line up with those implied by the first player's part. In other words, at that point the music had become polymetric. This arrangement then continued more or less consistently until about a minute later when a third player joined the group. That third player was playing a pair of rattles known as hosho, made from a distinctive gourd that had grown wild in the region since forever. The Hosho player was obviously playing a pattern that fell in line neither with the first player's meter nor that of the second, so, metrically speaking, the music had become quite dense by that point. And after continuing for a while, the music ended abruptly. It didn't formally close like most of the music we've heard in this class, but just stopped. I wonder why. Well, here's why. The title, Gathering Branches for Shelter, doesn't mean that a storm is blowing up and some people are getting ready for rain. These branches are being gathered for shelter against an enemy, in other words, for camouflage. This music serves the same function as the music in the Senesunian scene in Jimbifola. It was to encourage the people who were doing the work. Once sufficient branches had been gathered, then the music simply stopped. Its function had been realized. In the spirit of trying to tie things together by pointing out extensible principles, I want to remind you that you've heard something like that earlier during these lectures, but not in a lecture having to do with African music. It was from my abbreviated unit on music from Latin America, a San Juan dance tune played on the Imbabura harp, with the second player pounding on the harp's soundboard and singing a song about a dear old lady who had left the village. You may recall that there was no real formal design to that song. It was just a couple of contrasting phrases alternating in no predictable time interval, and a couple of verses scattered almost at random throughout the piece, and then an abrupt ending rather than a formal close. What I described there is pretty close to what you heard in Nema Musasa. That little dance tune from Ecuador was not meant to be listened to. It was to be danced to. So once the other revelers in the tavern were showing signs of fatigue or disinterest, then the little two-man band would just stop whatever tune they happened to be playing and start a different one, hoping to lure the customers back out onto the dance floor. It's often easy to determine whether a piece of music is meant for listening or as a background for some other activity by paying attention to the way it ends. Let's hear Nema Musasa one more time, and this time, as we go through, I'll point out some things that are happening.
whatever image you expected to come up at this point, I'm pretty sure it wasn't anything like this. If you find it disturbing, I'll consider that a good thing, and I hope my intentions will become clear as you listen to this part of the lecture. I'm about to play you some music by the Baaka, a group of rainforest dwellers in the Congo Basin, who until very recently had very little contact with the encroaching outside world, none of that contact wished for by them. They live much as they always have. They are among the few extant hunter-gatherer societies on earth. They are cooperative net hunters. They are celebratedly egalitarian. They are doomed. The lithograph you see here is of a couple of Baaka girls placed on exhibit at the German Geographical Congress in Stuttgart, Germany, sometime around 1875. Does that image evoke anything in you? Try to understand that neither the lithographer who made the art nor the attendees gathered to gawk at that exhibit saw anything wrong with what they were doing. As people go, I imagine there was about the same proportion of decent folk and real scoundrels among them then as now. But almost 150 years later, we do surely recognize something deeply disturbing, if not awful, about this, don't we? And why is it that we can see it, but they couldn't have? That's worth a lot of thought, and I hope you'll devote some to it. It's a mistake to take your culture for granted, to take its morality for granted, to take its wisdom for granted. Don't you find yourself thinking that the organizers of that Congress and those who attended it dressed in their finery and adorned with their bourgeois good manners should have questioned all that? Well, what about your own culture? How sure are you that your culture has arrived at the best way of being and of behaving? That 18th century culture surely could have used some introspection, but what about yours? That's the guiding thought that I'm going to leave you with as we finish this unasked for experiment in distance learning. It may be the most important thought that I can plant in your mind. I mentioned in passing that the egalitarianism of the Baaka is celebrated. It is something that anthropologists have long remarked on, and before I introduce you to their music, I need to lay some groundwork. You've heard me allude to the profound difference in worldview between foraging cultures and agricultural ones, beginning with the most fundamental thing of all, our relationship to the planet we live on. For foragers, whose food is grown by the earth, the earth generally comes to be regarded as a great and benevolent mother who feeds them. For agriculturalists, and later for industrialists, which is an inevitable extension of agriculture, the earth is a resource to be tamed, manipulated, used, and consumed. I can't imagine a more profound difference in worldview. But that alone does not account for the egalitarianism of foraging cultures and the social stratification of those involved in agriculture. An explanation for that difference is easily accounted for by a simple fact. If you gather your food rather than growing it yourself, there is no way to hoard that food. If you kill an animal for food, it must be eaten right away in that tropical climate or the meat will spoil and the life of that animal will have been wasted along with your effort. So a tribe of cooperative hunters like the Baaka are going to share that food with everyone who had a hand in killing it. And for the Baaka, that includes everyone in the tribe. But what agriculturalists tend to focus on is crops that can be stored. In other words, cereal crops, grains. If you can figure out a way to keep the harvest dry and keep the rodents out, you can store grains indefinitely. And if you can store them, you can lock them up. If you can lock them up, you can decide who eats and who doesn't. 
In that simple fact lies the origin of all socially stratified systems, which are inevitably authoritarian. With that arrangement, you get kings. The tribal chiefs of hunter-gatherers are not kings by any stretch of the imagination. They don't have special privileges. They have special responsibilities. The gradual shift from foraging to agriculture that began about 10,000 years ago as the ice sheets of the Pleistocene retreated entailed a profound shift in worldview, and that shift had ramifications for political arrangements, systems of religious observation, and of course, music and the other arts. The deities of hunter-gatherer people are overwhelmingly female, with the greatest of all being the benevolent mother who feeds us all, and their kinship systems tend to be matriarchal because of this. All that changes with agriculture. The ultimate civilized systems, the monarchies, come finally to be reflected in the priestly religious systems that support those monarchies, including their monotheism, which reflects the autocracy. This is a line of thought worth pursuing, but I will leave it to you to pursue it or not, as you wish. One of the features of Baaka life that most clearly reflects their essential egalitarianism is their cooperative approach to hunting. They are net hunters, and the hunt involves the entire tribe. Early in the morning of a typical hunt, the entire tribe will leave their village and move very quietly to a nearby hill where the hunt will take place. The men gather on one side of that hill, fanning out and stationing themselves at intervals, holding a large net woven from fibers that can be found in the rainforest with their spears at the ready. Meanwhile, the women and children will have moved stealthfully to the other side of the hill, armed with various noisemakers. At a prearranged signal, the women and children run up their side of the hill, shouting and banging on things and raising the most hellish racket they can. Any animal on the hill will, of course, run away from that awful noise, right into the net that awaits them. If the hunt is good, everyone eats well. If it's a little skinny, well, everyone eats, with the expectation that tomorrow, when they hunt on a different hill, the hunt will be more bountiful and they'll be better fed. That's basically it. One of the ways the Baaka prepare for the hunt is by singing, drumming, and dancing through most of the night that precedes it. Of course, this serves the purpose of preparing them mentally for the hunt. It's a kind of pep rally, and it is deeply religious in nature. What do their songs sound like? Here's something to consider. What would the music of a truly egalitarian society sound like? Would it move in lockstep unison? Of course not. That suggests that someone laid down the law. This is how music goes and everyone complies. That wouldn't work in an egalitarian society. Would it be homophonic? Not likely. In a homophonic texture, you have a hierarchy. The melody is clearly the most important thing. The focus lies there. The harmony just supports the melody. Doesn't that seem like a musical portrait of an autocracy? No, the music of the Baaka is polyphonic, and each voice is as important as every other voice, with no hierarchy whatsoever implied. In the field recording you're about to hear, the microphone was placed much nearer some of the voices than others, so it may sound as though there's a hierarchy here, but that's just an artifact of microphone placement. In reality, no one would be able to say which voice is more important because no one voice is more important than any other. This is a case of art reflecting life, a potent reminder, in fact, that the art of any culture is far more revealing of that culture's worldview than any other cultural feature you might study. Here's the music.
That is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. I wish I had an hour's worth of that recording instead of the few seconds I do have. I think I would never stop listening to it. How I wish that during the past four weeks we had been face-to-face -face in a classroom rather than relegated to an online format that affords none of the advantages of a classroom setting. Africa is something I'd most have loved talking about. No matter where your immediate forebears hail from, Africa is ultimately our home twice over. Twice over because not only did our species evolve there about a quarter million years ago, finding their way to other continents only gradually, our species survived a near wipeout by the eruption of Mount Toba in Indonesia about 65,000 years ago, only because some of the people who had never left Africa in the first place managed to survive the global famine that that eruption set in motion. Understand that I'm not talking here about those biblical famines that involve agriculture. That was far in the future. I'm talking about a collapsing food web. That happened, and it was Africans who survived it. It seems to me that we should have warm feelings for Africa, as for a mother. But that is not how Africa has been viewed by outsiders, is it? It's been exploited almost to death by economic and military powers far away. Its people have been kidnapped and shipped across the ocean and sold as slaves. And what is happening this very day in many, many regions of Africa is tragedy with a really human face. Why, you may ask, do I bring up these doleful thoughts? Above all, why would I choose to close this strange semester with such thoughts? As poet William Butler Yeats observed, education is not a pail to be filled, but a fire to be lit. I know that some of you would have preferred that I merely fill the pail, feeding you with tidbits of information that could be easily puked back up on a quiz for points toward a grade. But that's not education and I know it, and I think maybe you know it. What I've been trying to do here is light a fire. I can see that for some of you it's worked, and I'm grateful for that. It may take a few more years for others among you to get it. I do think that the drastic change of life that this epidemic has forced on all of us might be the occasion for some ways of thinking that are different from what you've known in the past, and I dare to hope that a better future, both for you and for the whole suffering family of humanity, might thereby be forged. Good luck to all of you, and Godspeed.